All right, well, I want to thank uh, Mike for inviting me and uh, just want to point out in my presentation, it's going to have a lot of data from a lot of different peoples. And uh, I want to thank everybody that contributed to the, the presentation. So the sugarcane aphid, as far as a pest of, of sorghum, it's it's pretty remarkable aphid. This is one of the few aphids uh, <coughs> in cropping system where I think you can see extreme injury from the time that crop emerges out of the ground to the time you're pulling, a, you're, you're cutting it. I mean, even during harvest, it, it poses a threat. And so that's very unusual, I think, for, for almost any insect pest. Uh, this is a, a chart I derived out of uh, uh, Van Rensburg's uh, 1973 publication. And it kind of shows the general trend of colonization that you usually see with sugarcane aphid in grain sorghum uh, developing uh, early and starting to really take off at booting and heading and then being most severe later in the season. Now this doesn't mean you can't get them early season. We know for a fact you can. I think, uh, and so this, this graph can uh, shift either way. And so what I want to do is first is just go through the different stages and give an idea of what we see as far as injury uh, during these stages and then what we can do to maybe protect the crop during these stages as well. In seedling, uh, you, what you'll see is a lot of stunning. We see a lot of stunning from uh, aphid infestation. And probably even more importantly, you may see some uniformity issues. And so what does this do, particularly for us guys that are in the southern areas, it's going to exasperate midge, midge problems because you're going to uh, have off times on your bloom. You can also see downright killing of the plants uh, and uh, seedling mortality can be very high. And as you move into pre-boot, this, in my opinion, may be, just from what I've, I've seen uh, in the field, this may be the most sensitive stage as far as injury goes. And you will see stunning. You can still see killing of the plants at this stage. But what we see that's most interesting, I think, is sterility issues. And so during this pre-boot period, when the head's developing and when it emerges, it, it comes out and it's completely sterile. There's no, you'll have 100% yield loss on severe infestations at this stage. And that kind of makes me wonder, you know, you read in the literature that there's no toxin involved with this aphid. And if maybe there is some sort of maybe a chronic toxin that we're not really picking up, but here you know, maybe it's causing the sterility. This is just a slide showing some of the stunning issues. You can t tell uh, during a pre-boot application that uh, one of uh, area was treated and the other area not treated, just the, the amount of delay in maturity you can see. And interesting thing is, the other thing we noted too, and this was actually with the seed treatment test, where we had seed treatments uh, and the aphids were, were controlled early on, we had very few fall armyworm infestations. But where we did not have seed treatment and we had a lot of aphids, we had heavy fall armyworms, moths coming in and ovipositing. And I kind of wonder if maybe the moths weren't attracted to the honeydew coming in, feeding on the honeydew, and then ovipositing. Just an uh, interesting observation. Uh, of course, you can get injury into the milk stage. Uh, you can also see some, uh, you're not going to likely see death at this point, although it has been reported. Mostly what you'll see reduction in yields, and again, the uniformity issues. This just demonstrates a, a field back in 2013, one of the first that we encountered where we had some early boot stage uh, grain sorghum where a uh, aerial applicator had an application error on the edge of the field and uh, essentially those those uh, that area of the field uh, saw mortality in the plants uh, outside of it looked fairly decent and just uh, uh, an idea of the kind of yield loss you can see this is from insecticide applications applied at bloom stage uh, you'll see your uh, response of your yield versus aphids per leaf. And if you look at this, it looks like about 100 aphids, in this case, equaled about a 340 pounds of grain loss. So that's at bloom stage. And you can also see injury at soft dough through the hard dough stage. And if you look at the literature, a lot of them will say, well, once you hit soft dough, you're, you're not likely to see any kind of yield reduction. Maybe, and I think we do see some test weight reductions uh, in, in these types of situations. This is uh, some data from uh, Angus Catchot in Mississippi State, and this was a soft dough infestation of sugarcane aphids, 
where they had some insecticide treatments versus a non-treated. And essentially, even at this stage, they were seeing a 21% reduction in yield due to uh, sugarcane aphid. And of course, at harvest, and this is one of Robert uh, Bowling's pictures. This is actually in, in hay with a hay cutter, but those are aphids on that hay cutter. So just going through this tremendous numbers of aphids that have the ability to uh, clog equipment. Uh, you can also end up with a lot of sticky honeydew on the leaves. I think the sticky honeydew uh, may interfere with uh, harvest aid products, things like glyphosate. I honestly think they may interfere with some of our insecticide uptake on our translaminar insecticides. And then, of course, these are going to clog the combines. When you get all that sugary, sticky uh, leaves going through the combine, it'll clog them up. We saw as much as 50% grain being dispelled out the back of the combine just simply because it couldn't filter it. And uh, it, of course, they, and then the farmers have to stop. They have to go to the, the shop, have to clean their machines, go back to the field. It takes a lot of time, and time is, is money for them. Just another uh, picture that picks when you get all that honeydew and sooty mold on a leaf, you know, there's a good chance, and we, and particularly in the south, where we have to use a lot of harvest days to dry our crop down. You know, glyphosate Roundup's going to have a very difficult time penetrating a bunch of sooty mold and honeydew to actually desiccate the crop. And then uh, the other picture is uh, one that uh, uh, Robert Goodson at Arkansas took a picture of. And that's just those are aphids in a grain in a, in a combine, so they're cutting they're cutting the aphids. <laughs> and what it's real interesting because once the crop dries down, it's, if you do get a successful desiccation of the crop. If there's aphids on those plants, they go straight up to the head, and they just congregate up there. And so when your combine comes through, it's, it's cutting aphids. Well, let's go into some of our insecticide decisions. And of course, uh, Mike's going to cover when to treat when he gets into his threshold talk. And what I want to talk about more is insecticides and then uh, just application technique and, and how these might fit into uh, harvest as well. Uh, we've had a number of tests we've conducted uh, at, uh, in Louisiana. There's been seed treatment tests in Mississippi uh, and throughout parts of uh, Texas as well. We've tried to coordinate these tests. This, this is one that we conducted last year in 2014, and it does show that, yeah, you can get some significant aphid infestations in seedling sorghum. Uh, the graph on the right actually shows where we were taking aphid counts on a per plant basis. You'll see that black bar initially was very high. And those were primarily alates, so we had a distinct migration event in here. And then we go to uh, picking up after us as, as we uh, uh, go through the season. The other graph on the left, that's when we switched to counting aphids per leaf because there were just simply too many to count on a, on a per plant basis in the untreated. But again, all the, uh, all the uh, um, seed treatments did a good job for us. And uh, we could see you can see control out of a, a out of a seed treatment upwards of maybe 40, 45 days at the max. And then, of course, there's our, our foliar insecticides. And honestly, we don't have a lot to choose from. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, dimethylate being a, a valid uh, option at one time. And I think that's, for the most part, been written off for us. And so I put it under the do not recommend category along with pyrethroids. And if you really want a lot of aphids, spray a pyrethroid. It does a really good job on increasing your aphid population. Uh, things that we're recommending, I mean, primarily it's transformed. That's what we have the Section 18 on and have had last year. It is highly effective. It seems to be fairly soft on our beneficials. You may need as much as two, in some cases, uh, you know, three applications of products. Ours were limited to just two applications of this product. Uh, it does have a 14-day PHI. And those PHIs are, are very important because they impact what we can and can't use as we progress to the season. Uh, chlorpyrifos, at, it, it can be used from one to two pints, and the one pint rate is just marginally effective. So you may get some suppression, and that's about it out of it. The two pint rate uh, does a, a fairly decent job, not all the time, but most of the time you'll see some, some pretty good activity out of it. Although I think this product is going to be tougher on beneficials, and that two-point rate has got a 60-day PHI, so that's going to greatly interfere with your ability to use it. And then I'll go into Savanto in a little bit more detail because that's our brand-new product, and I'll talk about it 
uh, on these slides. Now, this, uh, this just recently was labeled. And if you look at the, the, full, the full label on this crop, uh, on grain sorghum, it was seven to 10 and a half ounces. And, and if you look at the price structure, which may be $2.25 an ounce, well, that's just cost prohibitive. You can't, you, it's just not gonna be a player. It, nobody could afford to spray it. But what Bayer is doing is pursuing a section two double E looking at these reduced rates, this four to seven ounce rate. Now that even at the low rate, you're still looking at, at, at as much as a $9 per acre application. Still not cheap, but it, 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 as I'll show in a little bit, it looks pretty effective. Now this one does still have a 21 day PHI, so it's gonna limit our ut its utility, uh, much like uh, chlorpyrifos and some of those others, but not quite as severe. This is one of the initial tests we ran in Louisiana, and I think we may have had maybe four or five tests in the U.S. in 2013 that we used to, to pursue these Section 18s throughout the country. Uh, the new FOSS, that, that is uh, chlorpyrifos. What we're looking at is uh, percent control, and this was based on a, a Henderson Tilton's uh, uh, calculation, and the transform it announced looked very good, upwards of, I think, 93% control in this case, and the other products, which included we kind of just threw whatever we had that we thought might have some efficacy uh, in, into the, the mix. Honestly, I thought dimethoate and, new, and the new FOSS and maybe even the Malthon would do fine, uh, but lo and behold, they, they didn't work out so well. This uh, represents some data from David Bunton over in Georgia, and the reason I put this slide in there is I really wanted to point out two things. Number one, uh, the centric at two and a half ounces per acre. Now, a lot of states are, are looking to pursue an additional Section 18 for Centric. Uh, I kind of doubt that the EPA will grant it just because of the, the B toxicity issues, but uh, it is something that's being pursued by a number of states. It looks highly effective. And, uh, and then I also want to put, point out his uh, lower span uh, 4E. That's the, the two pint rate. And as, as I mentioned, you can see some activity out of it, it's much better. Well, it's about double what you expect out of the one pint. So it does have uh, some good activity. And then down on the end, the, the karate, uh, you can see some negative control with that product. This is another uh, slide from David. And again, the reason I put this in there is uh, basically, you know, the show that transforming an ounce and ounce and a half, ounce and a half looks good as well as the Savanto at five ounces. All very good products. But then David had a county agent that had a brilliant idea. He said, well, what if we mix the lower span at a pint and the dimethoate at a pint and try to avoid that 60-day PHI? And so you'd still have a 30-day PHI. And they did that, and lo and behold, it looks pretty good. Now, that's only one data point, but I think it could be a viable option in the future. Not the best ones because it's a harsh chemistry. but. If uh, push come to shove, you know, it could be a, a, an alternative. Again, negative 91% control with karate. This is some more data uh, on Savanto, looking at the really low rates. Uh, so you can see the, the purple bar is Savanto at three ounces. So that's even below the four ounce recommended that's gonna be on the two double E. And, and you can see at, at seven days post application, 100% control with that product. Uh, very comparable to uh, an ounce and a half of, of transform. So I do think it's gonna be a highly uh, beneficial product to have in our, in, our, in our portfolio. Now I do wanna talk about adjuvants because you'll see a lot, if you go, particularly these, these chemical dealers, they sell adjuvants. That's what they make their money off of and they're gonna to wanna to put an adjuvant with it. And what I'm gonna tell you to do is you don't put an adjuvant with it unless you know what that adjuvant's gonna do. Uh, what we, we conducted this test in, uh, in, in Louisiana. We looked at a, an ounce rate of transform and then we put a half rate in, the, uh, half an ounce. And then we just mixed that half ounce rate with a variety of different uh, adjuvants. And we saw that some adjuvants may actually be of no benefit. Well, all of them, none of them differed from uh, the transform by itself. Uh, and if you just looked at the, the degree of the, the height of the bars, you know, if some were helping, it wasn't very much. And there's some that obviously look like they may be uh, detrimental. So be careful with the adjuvants. 
And of course, application. Coverage is critical with this pest. Uh, by ground, we're recommending at no less than 10 gallons per acre. That's a minimum. We'd prefer to see that at 15 or 20. And by air, and good luck with some of that, by air, no less than five gallons per acre. A lot of these aerial applicators want to go out at two, two and a half gallons, and they really need to be discouraged from doing that. And we had some growers in Louisiana last year actually applied by air 10 gallons per acre, and they paid extra for it, but you know what, it, it, it really helped. So I want to talk about control success or failure with these products. And I've seen everything that we've used fail. I've, seen, I've been to a number of transform applications that were just failures. And on the other hand, I've seen everything work. I've seen dimethyl weight work. And, it, and a lot of it depends on when you catch that aphid population. If you're looking at an aphid population that's in decline, you can spray dimethyl weight and it looks wonderful. If you catch it on the upslope, it may not look so good. So, so uh, that, that, that does play a critical role in success versus failure. Also, as I mentioned, good coverage and, and treating before the aphids are abundant. And I think Mike will address that in his talk. The other thing that I've noticed is don't mix these products with pyrethroids. In fact, let's try to avoid using pyrethroids in the system if we can get away with it. Uh, we had a lot of transformer failures when they went out with pyrethroid because they were wanting to get midge also. And then also cool conditions. And this is something that needs further investigation. I noticed uh, we had a cool spell in Louisiana and at that point I started getting a lot of calls on control problems. And I think Transform is, has a pretty short residual and under these cool conditions that the aphids aren't feeding and taking up the product, then they're not gonna be ingesting it. And uh, as it warmed back up, well, by that time the residual uh, of, the, of the material was low enough that it wasn't uh, helping anymore. And then of course the whole problem with honeydew and sooty mold may be blocking the uh, insecticide access to the leaf for a translaminar product. We need to consider the entire system. Sorghum midge. This, this is a, a critical factor for us in much of the south and it, uh, sorghum midge applications are automatic. As soon as you start seeing bloom they spray. And so we need to get back to IPM on this. Get guys scouting Let's not just treat midge uh, automatically. And remember that these pyrethroids are definitely going to flare these aphids. Uh, and we're telling our growers, you know, let's, if, you don't ha if you have low midge to moderate midge population, consider using chlorpyrifos, lower span, at a pint. Because it does suppress the aphid populations and it does have activity on midge. Uh, now, if you have heavy, aphid, uh, heavy midge pressure, I may still be tempted to go with the pyrethroid just because the chlorpyrifos isn't quite as effective. This uh, depicts what some of these mid sprays may do compared to transform at an ounce and a half. And you can see uh, the new FOS is the chlorpyrifos. You know, you can see some suppression of the aphids with that product. And then you look at your percent reduction in midge injury. Again, the new FOS does have, at a full pint, it's gonna have some decent activity on the midge population. Another one that we looked at in this particular test is this Blackhawk, and that's Spinosad, which isn't going to have activity on the aphid, but, uh, and we're not ready to recommend it because we don't have much data on it, but I think it may prove useful for midge activity and be, would be extremely soft on the beneficials. Need, need more data on Spinosad for midge. And then harvest aid and desiccants. I'll, through much of the south, these crops have to be desiccated before we can get in and harvest them. And so with honeydew and sooty mold on the leaves, if you have aphids out there and those, you may have problems getting your desiccants to work, number one. Number two, the, 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 sort of the aphids moving up to the plant. And the PHI you know, you're gonna, is so short, you know, uh, we really have no options to, to, to spray in that window to control the aphids. And so, um, what we're telling our guys, if you have a lot of uh, honeydew, consider using something like sodium chlorate. It tends to work better when there's a lot of residue on the, on the leaves. And also to consider, if you have time and, and, that, and you have two weeks to work with, consider using Transform mixed with your desiccant. And, uh, <clears throat> and I, I, we, we're in desperate need of something that, that has a shorter PHI than, than 14 days. And then just to, to follow us up with the, the, the use windows as I see them, 
Uh, you know, I think the uh, seed treatments are, are is an easy call on sorghum. They're going to provide that first 30 to 40 days protection of the crop up until head initiation. And then as it stands now, we have, well, Transform or Savanto, maybe that two-ounce rate of chlorpyrifos. And if you have world feeders in that, in that period, usually you don't need, people need to realize usually you don't need to treat those. And if you do, don't use a pyrethroid because they're ineffective on world feeders anyway. About the only thing that works is Prevathon, and it's expensive. Uh, and then as you get into flowering, again, uh, Transform and Savanto fall in that window. Uh, if you've got midge uh, in, with aphids, chlorpyrifos might be a good option. And as we get into our dough, uh, soft dough and hard dough stages, again, we, we just don't have a lot to, to offer. Transform and Savanto. <laughs> and, uh, and then late, last, of course, uh, Transform again. And with that, I believe I'm out of time, and I want to again thank everybody for uh, inviting me to the to the conference.